March 21, I was removed from my unit and my core role, and I was um, my job now is basically to powerlift and represent the Royal Navy. Um, I've received an invitation to represent Team GB for um, the World Bench Press Championships. I was the first person in the military to ever uh, be selected. And as I came up, as the referee Mick, uh, the British referee, he just went down to give the signal to put it down. As he said down, it just went bang, and it moved up oh. about three inches. And I was still holding on to it, and I thought, don't let go, don't let go, get the lift, get the lift at least. When my bicep snapped, I sat down and I had the ice on there and I just thought, my lifting days are done. I'm never coming back. There were so many things running through my mind at the time. And I had a wobbler, it's done. You can't control what's happened. He says, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna sit down and work out what we can do. What are we in control of? And basically seven months from coming out of Derriford to being back on the international platform representing Team GB. Well, if I'm going back to 195, I'll have surpassed my, my 190 that I did before I did my arm, which means I'm tipping in the realms of 200 kilo bench press, which I think is quite a nice, nice milestone, isn't it? Welcome to the Everyday Perspective podcast. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel. Today's guest is Wes McGuinness. Wes, how are you, mate? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me on. No, absolute pleasure, mate. Uh, the plan today, um, as, as the audience might be able to tell you, a bit of a lump and you do a bit of lifting. So uh, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about building strength, specifically around powerlifting. Um, and we're, we're going to cover a little bit of a niche, I guess, in the sense that you're quite a high level competitor, uh, but you're also a military man. You're also a father. You're natural. So we want to talk about, I guess, your journey in the military, in competing and powerlifting and how, how you build strength while juggling a job, a family, everything else. So, so that's the plan, mate. So it's great to have you. Um, so yeah, that's that's what, what came first. Was it military or powerlifting? Uh, military. Let's start there then. Yeah, I took so, yeah. powerlifting in the military. Um, I think it was around 2011. Yeah. Um, I've always lifted weights, you know, I've always been a, a gym goer. And um, I was at HMS Drake and I saw a, a poster on the wall and it was like Navy powerlifting championships. I was like, um, I've been deadlifting recently and I thought, you know what, I'll give this a go, I'll see what my warm rep max is. So I um, signed up for it, it was at HMS Temeraire. Yeah. And um, I went there and I won it all. Uh, I broke the Navy records. I just don't think because powerlifting wasn't like a, um, a big profile sport at the time. There wasn't many competitors and entries. Uh, but I went there and uh, with no strength training, no you know background knowledge of programming or anything, I went there and uh, I ended up winning it and breaking some records. So um, that, on the journey back, I always remember this very... Um, I remember this very well. I was travelling back on the train and it had, a, it had like a big profound impact on me. I thought, I'm not too bad at this, you know, and if I start researching into periodization, programming, you know, training correctly for squat bench and deadlift, mm. I couldn't, you know, I could get quite good at this. Um, and yeah, for, you know, fast forward uh, 12 years, <laughs> I've, done, I've done too bad. Yeah, amazing. So, so I guess like going in and just smashing records off the bat would indicate that you've obviously got some sort of natural uh, talent towards lifting i mean what was your upbringing like did you grow up sort of like on a farm i was going to say no, yeah like a farm yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah no it was nothing like that. i wasn't throwing like hay bales around no. anything like that no 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 i just um my, my uncle my uncle peter took me under the under the wing yeah. um you know last few years of school uh he's always massively into his weights and he just showed me how to you know do your basic basic exercises yeah, yeah. you know and then since then i got hooked and i just enjoyed it and I just took it from there. Yeah, okay. And what led you into the military then? And then, then what, what do you do in the military? Um, I'm a PLK -er, um by trade. Mm -hmm. But um, as of March uh, 21, um, I was uh, approved and enrolled onto the Royal Navy Elite Athlete Scheme for powerlifting. Yeah. So that, so what does that mean then? Does that, is it the same sort of thing as uh, so, what you had? Um, from, from March 21, I was removed from my unit and my core role, and I was um, my job now is basically to powerlift and represent the Royal Navy and be a, basically an ambassador to sport, promote sport, grassroots, um, and just, just dis display how important physical development in our services is. Yeah. And also pass on the baton to the new generation of sailors that are coming through the gates of rally and like Collingwood in their phase twos and just 
give them my perspectives and my experiences and say, look, I took a powerlifting in the military, in the military, um, and like I said to you before we came on live, I did a, a, a brief at Collingwood, there could be someone who's really good at tennis or mm -hmm. a different sport, and if they can go into the fleet with a confidence, um, knowing, well, oh, actually, I remember that brief from Wes, I could do this, and then they can go into the confidence uh, for their job and, 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 and go after their sport and goals and aspirations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Which good. is, I think, it's part of my job, to be fair, because I'm not going to be powerlifting forever. You know, um, and if I can, you know, pass on my experiences and everything else to the other sailors, um, then I think that, that's a massive part of the job. Yeah, I imagine you're quite unique as well as finding the sport in the, in the military. So most people would have gone in, like you said, some people might be good at tennis, then mm -hmm. then go into tennis further in the military. Mm -hmm. Whereas you, you found it in the military. Yeah. So then it's a bit more of a, like a, when you're talking to people and talking about what they can achieve and what they can do, mm -hmm. You know, you're talking from that experience of you found it while you're here. You yeah. know, it's completely new. And then like you've gone on to an elite level at that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. It's funny, actually, growing up, my, uh, my, I was never in the military, nor was my dad. But, you know, coming from like a fairly rough area mm -hmm. of the city, he often talked about the, the sort of military as an, op as an option. Yeah, yeah. And he always referred to the Navy, actually, specifically, and said it was great for sport. Yes. And at the time I was boxing. And he always said, like, join the Navy because you just go in and just box. <laughs> I was tempted, I nearly did, but I didn't in the end. So I think the Navy must have a bit of a reputation for, for supporting athletes. They, is that, is that they right? They do, you know. They've got, you know, they've got the priorities, you know, operations and deployments and mm. everything else that, that comes with a job. But um, I have been very lucky to be supported the way I have. And that's not just through, like, Navy and uh, Navy Sports Command, HMS Temeraire and stuff. I'm talking about... Um, my, when I used to be a, a leading chef on board a submarine, I used to have members of my team who would support me. Uh, for an example, I got selected for the Arnold Sports uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger Sports uh, Classic in Barcelona mm -hmm. in 2019. And at the time, we were hot. We were doing some um, big deployments and, and and time away. And uh, my department says, "Where's we will we'll support you, and we will do." that bit of sea time so you can get your training in and compete and do something that you've never done before. So that, you know, even it's just the people that make it to be fair, you know, my commanding officer was so supportive um, of, of stuff like that. And um, yeah, if it wasn't for them kind of people who've, who've helped me along the way, I wouldn't have got to that, to that point. Yeah, no, it's good. And there's something that Ricky talked about as well. If you saw that episode, he's a yeah. uh, army jujitsu athlete. Mm -hmm. And he said the same, that the lads support him so much. Yeah. And it's the unit that have, have kind of got him, you know, quite far along that, that path. So mm -hmm. that's good. Um, tell us about actually joining the military then. So uh, what age did you go in? And, and also I've, I've never really had a conversation with a submariner before in regards to like, right. life on the submarine. So I'm curious. So tell us about that. Tell us how you like joined what age, um, whether it was always the plan to, to be on the subs and, and what, what life um, on the subs like? So I, I joined in 2008 and uh, originally didn't join as a submariner. It was my divisional officer that um, persuaded me to join the submarine service, told me the perks about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I joined it. Um, I, I, I applied to go to the submarine service halfway through my basic training. Um, but yeah, I joined in 2008. And, what age were you? Uh, 19. Um, <laughs> and... My main reason for joining the, the the navy was for like job security was the biggest thing for me. I thought being out in civilian in civilian world at like seventeen eighteen, I was just moving in from job to job to job, getting laid off, redundant, and I just didn't like that feeling of uh, the navy is so good for, you know, I don't need to worry about healthcare, dental care, even the gym, you know, all that kind of stuff. I just love that support network that the Navy or the military provide because they do across all three services. You're just well looked but after, aren't you? I, I think I am. There's a lot of, moan, you know, moaning and dripping about the services, but if you take a step back and you weigh out all the pros and cons, you know, the, it, one outweighs the other for me, 100%. But that's not for everyone. Um but yeah, I, I absolutely love the Navy and I love all the support that they offer and they continue to offer me as well. Yeah, where did you grow up, mate? Uh, Sunderland. Sunderland, yeah, I was yeah. trying to paste the accent. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived down in, uh, in, in, in Plymouth for so long, yeah, I've, yeah. I hardly have a go home now, so yeah. it seems to wear off a little bit. <laughs> yeah, is, is that part of the world, is it is it quite affluent or is it is it sort of, sort of like a lot of um, no resources there for the people? 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like mo- most areas. Um, like a lot of job opportunities or not? Not really. No. Um, well, I didn't find that anyway. You know, it was bars. At that age, 17, 18, well, not 17, but 18 years old, it was like, um, it was bars, you know, glass collecting jobs. Um, I find most people go to Nissan to work. Well, they did back then yeah. go to work because Nissan was the biggest company up there at the time. But um, for, for me, I, I felt like I had to get out of there. Yeah, it, it's not a naval town, is it? Like no, 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 no. Okay. And what 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 was the exposure to the military? Was it was it the, were the family members in the military, or was it like a, a job well, centre thing? Like how did you even come across um, the idea? It was, I lived with my nana at the time, and um, it was my next door neighbour, uh, my next door neighbour Tommy. He was uh, uh, a uh, he was in the navy. He was a uh, uh, naval police, and uh, I used to go for a drink with him now and then. And he said, "Where did you think about joining the service?" And I thought, mm, "Not not really." So I gave it some thought. And he, you have to take a psychometric test uh, when joining the, the Navy. Uh, and he sat down and, you know, my, my grades weren't amazing at school, you know. I, was, I wasn't, didn't have the best um, grades. But he sat down, he helped me improve on my maths, my English, you know, all that kind of stuff to hit the grade and get in. So, yeah, um, he, he was great, really good support. I still keep in touch with him now. Um, but, yeah, that's where it come from. Yeah. That's good. So back to the uh, the basic training. Then you make the decision to join the subs, mm-hmm. and then what's that journey like? Um, it's it's quite demanding. You know, you've got to do your. your it's split into uh, your dry phase, so your your all your classroom work yeah. after your base after your um, my chef training. You go into your part three, so you um, you do all your classroom work and you learn about submarines. You know, hydraulics, all the systems uh, by the book. And then once you pass your oral boards and your all your, your exams weekly you then go and join your unit so whatever submarine or class that'll be and then you go and put all that knowledge into practice and then sit an oral board it's quite a long process but it's worth it and then you go and um join your unit you do all of that um and then you'll sit an oral board with you know a commissioned officer and and a non-commissioned officer and then once you've done your walk rounds and you've passed your board, you're then uh, awarded you. Well, you co- you qualified as a submariner, mm-hmm. and then normally um, you'll do it um, either when you get back from deployment or wherever, um, and you'll be awarded your tot of rum. You must. I don't know if you've heard this. You get like a tot yeah. of rum with your dolphins badge in it, um, and the cap. The commanding officer will say, "Welcome to an elite club." You know, once you've got all your qualified people there, and say, "Look, it's one of the best clubs in the world," um, and then you'll 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 knock your rum back and you have to catch your dolphins in your teeth and then everyone applauds and they'll welcome you to the submarine service yeah <laughs> no I've never had that no I haven't and then when you when you get deployed then like how like how long are you at sea for well it depends depends on the class of submarine can, um, can you talk through the different classes yeah you've got your, your Vanguard class which are primarily based up in Fars Lane in Scotland then you've got your A your Stu class which are also um, assigned up in, in, in Fars Lane as well uh, but now we have uh, some berth down in Plymouth as well and then you've got your Trafalgar class which are on the way out of like the end of their life yeah. and they're based down in Plymouth and what, what what's what's the purpose of each class um, it depends what the tasking is really yeah um, your 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 Vanguard class without going into too much detail are basically just to protect uh, the nation from any external threats basically um, but yeah and in regards to like the weaponry on them, does that vary much, or are they all pretty much the same? In regards um, to what they carry? Yeah, they they vary. Because living living down this part of the country here about the sort of nuclear subs, and mm-hmm. and I don't know if that's just the, the the engines and the power source, or whether that's actual nuclear <coughs> weapons or what. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know how much you can probably say. <laughs> but no, I can't talk too much <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> no spilling military secrets on this podcast today. <laughs> Fair enough. And what are the conditions like on the subs? Like what the how big are the bunks and... Well, I spent 11 years on HMS Trench and um, <laughs> I probably should have got drafted off sooner, but I made it work for me. I just kept on getting extended because I had good people around me, good department, yeah. good people working for me, me working for other people. I had great commanding officers and I thought, I know what I've got. So I stayed on there for 11 years, um, but the conditions um, are tight. Yeah, okay. You know, we've only got limited amount of kit and space. Uh, I'm not allowed to make a lot of noise. You know, if we're on water restrictions, all that kind of stuff, fizz will get taken out. So you can't, I can't continue getting stronger on a submarine. It doesn't work like that. You can keep yourself fit. You know, we've got punching bags and um, what bikes and, you know, we've got those, I don't know if you've seen those weights where you can adjust them so you can go from like 12 kilo to 40 kilo. But again, we used to do it in the WSC 
which is the weapon storage compartment, and you've got people sleeping in there. Right. So you try and have a workout. I thought while someone's kipping. <laughs> you try, honestly, the line right next to you, but you, you're trying to be quiet, and it, it, you can keep yourself fit, but you can't like get you can't continue doing like strength training on there. Yeah, so um, you can't drop a, a fucking two hundred no, kg no, bar. No. I've been re briefed a few times, but I just keep the noise down. <laughs> I thought you could just maybe really focus on eccentric lifting, oh, strength, man. and you'd be fine. But <laughs> nothing at all then, though. No? no, but we've had, we've had some kit. We have like one hundred and forty kilo of weights on there, and a barbell, and like uh, deadlift deadeners, uh, deafeners, I think they're called. We right, can yeah. put them down. and just you know don't bang and make loads of noise because then you get. Rebriefed again off that, but um, yeah. <laughs> rebriefed. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like the the this, these are probably dumb questions to you, but I'm, I'm genuinely interested. So, like the the noise issue mm -hmm. is that because of of being anonymous under the water? Is it is it because of a more of a mechanical thing? Well, it's basically you want to be as quiet as possible in the water, don't you? So the other submarines don't hear you, or ships, or helicopters, or whatever. So if you can be as quiet as possible, then you stay undetected, and that's the whole purpose of submarine, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the less noise you make. And say, so where's you can't be deadlifting in the bomb? The we call it the bomb shop. You can't be deadlifting in the bomb shop, Wes. <laughs> so, and to be fair, because I used to be a uh, leading chef on board, yeah. after you've done 12, 14 hours in the galley, the kitchen on board, I just went to bed. You know, I had a shower and went to bed, or I went to watch a, a movie in my bed and just went to bed. I, I, when I'm at sea and deployed, I used to just give myself my body a break. It was nice. Yeah. You think about it, you do all this training. And, you know, you get little niggles and stuff. It's nice to just give your body a bit of a break from all of it. And then when I get back and I've got a bit of time alongside, it makes me hungry to get back into it again. So it was a nice little break for me. Yeah, and what's the, what's the longest that you've been sort of deployed on a sub for? Uh, about three months, yeah. Okay. What, the whole time? Yeah, yeah. <sighs> and um, during that period, are you pretty much under, under the water yeah, the whole time? Yeah, there times, yeah, where we're not allowed to send emails off or anything, so... Yeah. I want to speak to my wife. Do you shit yourself going down? Is that what? That's <laughs> um, the first thing I think. Like, I'd actually shit myself going into a time, sub going under. Well, I'm, you know I'm actually I mean? going to ask him about the fucking Titanic <laughs> sub that imploded recently. <laughs> minute, so we're getting there, mate. About that. Um, but yeah, the first time we dive the submarine, it's scary. I could imagine every trainee and person that comes on board, because we've had civilians with film crews and stuff, the first time you dive the submarine and you witness it, you think, wow, this is real. Yeah, you what, what depths do they go down to? Uh, deep. That's covert, mate. God, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Does it does like you know? Is it is it creaking as the pressure increases? Do you, do you are you aware of like the depths as as you're going yeah, we've down? Yeah, depth gauges, so you can walk around the submarine and you'll see we're at this depth, right. or you know, so everyone should be aware or can yeah. make sure they're aware of the depth that we're at. Yeah, and uh, without going into specifics, because I know you, you obviously can, but have you ever been in, in combat in a sub where you've been like shot at or no? No, okay. no. so it's all just sneaking around the covert yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. <laughs> if you're getting shot, you're doing something wrong, aren't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're being caught. <laughs> yeah, the Russians have got you, mate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's fascinating. <laughs> one of the one of the coolest things I say, coolest things. Um, excuse the pun. The the best thing I've ever done in the submarine service though was ISEX eighteen where we went to the North Pole. We oh, did wow. an exercise with the Americans. Um, and we've not, done, we, we've not done that exercise since the incident on HMS Tylus. Uh, unfortunately, two lads uh, passed away on there. But we won't go into too much detail on there, but it was the first time we'd uh, done it since then. Um, and we went to the North Pole, the most northerly point a submarine sur can surface through ice on the North Pole. Um, and... Uh, we got we got there. We broke through it, um, and if you Google it, YouTube it, you'll be able to see it all. Wow. Um, and every, it was minus thirty seven degrees up there. You know, we weren't allowed to stay up there more than I think we were fifteen minutes before you start. Like your nose starts going black and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I went down. I turned the galley off. I said, "Boys, let's get up there." Um, and I went down to the bomb shop and got some weights and a barbell. And uh, they were like, what are you doing? Myself? I was like, right, use, utilize the manpower. And I was like, get that up there. Everyone was like in line going up the main access. I was like, get that up there. I says, I'm never ever going to be able to do this ever in my life again, if anyone ever has. Um, and we took it onto the ice. 
Um, and I managed to get, even your phone as well would only work for like a few minutes up there because it was so cold, it just shut off. So I was like, right, get a video. So we put like 100 kilo on this barbell. And again, I, I can send it over to you if you want. Class, yeah, um, and I got do. like a set of like squats on the ice and you can hear the ice creaking. God. Obviously we're through it. We're still on a lot of thick ice, so it's not yeah. going to break through, but it was surreal. You've got the submarine in the background <laughs> yeah. and you've got the American boats around there. And the guys were playing cricket. They brought a, a cricket bat and ball up there. It was, it was, it was crazy. It was just a big triangle. So you had two American boats and that was HMS Trench and, and we just had a great big like you know get together on there. It was it was it was an in the ex- middle of nowhere, such yeah. a good experience. Um which I'll never ever do again. And again, that's another selling point that I try and tell these phase twos and phase ones that look look at these opportunities that are there for you. Like I didn't have to take the weight up there, but I thought I'm gonna capitalise on this opportunity. Um and what a good video that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> still on operations and still getting some squats in at the North Pole. Yeah. It's just yeah, it was good. And even the even the, the commanding officer Dave Burrell at the time, he got some deadlifts in there with a flag behind him. It was brilliant. It was just it was good. It was real good. Yeah. How, how cold did that feel though? I just did more reps just to keep <laughs> <my hair. laughs> on and a woolly hat on and a scarf and everything. Yeah, that's pretty wicked. So uh, before we get into like the detail around your lifting and everything else, what would you say to people that are maybe considering joining the Navy and specifically becoming a submariner? Absolutely do it. You know, if you, you've got to do your background work on submarines, you see a lot of people like myself, I joined the submarine service with no knowledge about submarines. You know, you need to know what you're in for. You know, it's a very demanding job. Every role on board is demanding, especially I'm going to say this because I was a chef on board. It's one of the hardest jobs on board. Um, you need to know that the work... When you're at sea, you need to put the work in, you know. And um, but there's a lot of benefits, you know. For example, the pay's really good. That's one of the main uh, driving factors um, of joining the submarine service. Uh, the specialist pay on there, the experiences, you know. I've done some sneaky, sneaky stuff, um, <laughs> which you know I can talk to my friends about um, behind closed doors, obviously. But um, <laughs> um, but yeah, if you're committed to it, it's hard work understanding because you, like I said, you have to learn about hydraulics. Uh, ventilation, you know, all, all the EOPs, the emergency procedures and all that kind of stuff. Because when you're down and deep and someone goes off like a fire or something, you're the only people who can react to that. Um, and everyone has a part to play. And if no one does, you know, something's gonna, there's going to be some holes in the cheese there, isn't there? So, um, But my answer to your question is, yeah, if you're thinking about joining the submarine service, do it because it's, um, it's an experience, which I, I've loved, you know. Yeah, amazing. You you mentioned um, when you were when you were being spoken to about it during your training, there were some perks as well that were you were told about. What are the perks of, of being some owner? Um, You know, uh, there's like I said, the, other than the, the experiences, the, the experiences, experience. the pay's good. You know, when you sail, um, obviously you can't take the full department to sea. So we have a thing called in the submarine service called Fifth Watch. So if you're not at sea, you're basically at home or being employed somewhere else where you can drive your leave down, uh, your leave balances down, spend time with your family, go on them holidays, you know, learn to drive, for example, do all those little things, those self-admin things that you want to do. Um, and then if you've got a full, you know, fully fit department, you can rotate around. Like I have before previously, um, I had X amount of time off and then I flew out, joined the submarine and then relieved my leading chef, he went off and did his bits, did his family bits. We just rotated around that. It was good working uh, routine. Yeah, amazing. I, I don't think they have that on general service ships. I don't think they do, you know. Um, someone might correct me, but I don't think they, think they do because a few people that I know that work on uh, in the general service, they've, I've had to explain what fifth what, what, watch is. So um, I think that's a great perk because you get to do all those nice little things, you know, with your family. And even if you're like... It's just time to have on your own, even if it just means sitting in your cabin or at home, just chilling out, playing on your Xbox. Mm-hmm. It's just that reset, isn't it? Mm-hmm. You know, prepping yourself ready for your next 12 weeks away. Yeah. What's going on, guys? This episode is sponsored by Eden Clinic for Men, who specialise in men's health and male hormones. The details are on the screen now and in the description below. Head on over to their website and get yourself booked in for a blood test. Select EDP, which is the everyday perspective to get yourself a discount. In addition to male hormones such as testosterone, these tests also look at other health markers such as diabetes type 2, heart health, liver function and kidney function. The clinic is run by Dr. Angela Service, who featured on episode 13, where she spoke in length about the negative symptoms that men can experience if they're deficient in some of these hormones, such as low mood, low libido, fatigue and weight gain. 
So if either you, maybe one of your mates, your dad isn't feeling quite right, then it's worth having a look at some of these metrics and some of these markers to see how your health is on the inside. Even if you are feeling tip top, it's worth having a look now because in the future that may change and it gives you the ability to look back and have a benchmark. This is something that we feel really passionate about, guys, otherwise we literally wouldn't be telling you about it. Dr. Angela Service and her team can work wonders in regard to getting things corrected and improving your life and your health. It isn't something worth taking a chance on, fellas, so get on over and get yourself booked in. Awesome, guys. Thanks for your time. Back to the episode. Right, let's get into some of the uh, the good stuff then, shall we, about the, the powerlifting, getting strong. So you, you kind of give us a little bit of a quick summary at the, the very beginning in regard to kind of how you found powerlifting. Um, but let's kind of just pick it back up from there. So you've done a bit of lifting. Um, you kind of entered the, the little tournament in the, the Navy, I think you said, and you broke a few records. So tell us what those records were, first of all. I th- what was it? I think my first ever Navy powerlifting lifts in a competition were like a 140 kilo squat. That's 320s either end. Um, good milestone. I think I benched 122 and a half kilo. Um, and my deadlift was like 200 or something along the lines of that, I think. Um, and yeah, I was just I was just so pleased I hit the targets I wanted to do at the time. Amazing. What were you weighing at the point? At that point oh, time? the lightest I ever have. Okay, which is what? <laughs> um, I, was se- I remember this. I was 76 kilo. I was, it's the lightest I've ever Fucking been. Hell. 76 <laughs> kilos. <laughs> I'm not sure what we've ever... Fuck yeah. me, mate. Yeah. 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 yeah, it was the thinnest I've ever been. I'm now 101 kilo. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> that's fatherhood, I think. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Having kids and yeah. life. Yeah, we can attest to that. 100%. Um, so... We we did a we did an episode about powerlifting. It was literally like episode two or three, okay. um, and it was more from a coaching perspective. And in that episode, uh, Jero, who was who was the guy on, did give us a little bit of information around powerlifting. But just to say, people going all the way back and watching that if mm-hmm. they if they haven't already, can you just tell us real quick um, what powerlifting is and and sort of how, yeah, what what the, the what the sort of sports based around what the lifts are and everything else real quick? Yeah, sure. So powerlifting is quite often mistaken with Olympic lifting. You know, you're cleaning, you snatches, you jerks, all that kind of stuff. Powerlifting's uh, a squat, a back squat, a bench press, and a deadlift. Um, in competition, you have three attempts of each lift, okay? Um, and then your best lift of each discipline then gets added up to a total. Obviously, it's broken down in all body weight categories. Um, so, yeah, so like your first lift, I've always thought of something, a rule of thumb is something you could easily triple in the gym. So if anything went wrong, you lost your bar path or anything like that, you'd still be able to get on the board um, and get points because what you don't want to do is go too heavy, end up having, um, you know, a mistake on the platform or making mistakes or whatever, and not getting on the board because that's called bombing out in the powerlifting um, world. Because once you set your weight on there for say two hundred kilo squat, if you fail it, you can't lower it. You can only stick to that weight or right, you know, oh, really? I don't know. weight. So it's, I always say to people, look, it's not what you start with, it's what you finish with. And I've made this mistake because I bombed out at the BDFPA Nationals 2014. You know, I <laughs> went too heavy and I went all the way to Telford, I think it was, and uh, got a cheers, cheers for turning up trophy. So I, lo- I, I did learn from that, you know, um, and I try and pass on that experience. I was like, I went to, you know, I went too heavy. I should have dropped it 10, 15 kilo and got on the board and just built it up from there. But I didn't, I swallowed, I didn't <laughs> swallow it and I paid the price, you know, and yeah. I was destined to be on the podium. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't, I, walked, I drove home with uh, just a, 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 a cheers for turning up trophy, like I said. But um, but yeah, you, 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 you build up to that third, you know, that third lift and that should be so... You, you, your first one should be something you can easily triple, mm-hmm. get on the board. I always think your second one should be like a, a gym PB, personal best. And then your third one should be a new PB, whether it's by 2.5 kilo or whatever. But that, that's my opinion on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you do all three lifts and then you've got a bench press, uh, which is paused um, in competition. It's not like a touch and go bounce off the chest one. Um, it has to be paused, stationary on the chest, and then the referee will say press and you have to press it off your chest and lock out. It's very strict powerlifting. You have to adhere by the rules. Um, it's not like training in the gym. Um, and then on the deadlift, you've got two ways of deadlifting. You've got conventional, which is the normal way you normally see it. And then you've got the sumo. Um, and they're both legal lifts. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of people lift sumo. I say a lot of people. 
lift sumo because you obviously you can recruit a lot more muscles uh, in the sumo. But um, it de- it depends what your biomechanics are and your lev- your levers and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, brilliant. All right, mate, thanks. Um, and then with the the scoring, so you said obviously there were the three lifts, and is it like the final lift that scored, or is it the the, the heaviest lift? Yeah, well, you your bet. Yeah, your heaviest lift of all three gets added up because you want the biggest total of that weight category to win or podium or you know improve. Um, but then the the federation I lift in British Powerlifting and the IPF, they've got like a good lift uh, formula. So they'll take your body weight, do some kind of formula with it with your total, and then that will give you your good lift points. Um, so it's like a body weight weight lifted ratio kind of. Yeah. Okay. It's almost like a pound for pound strength. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And then uh, what? What? So you've told us what weight what, what weight you actually weigh on now, but what weight do you compete in? What weight are the hundred under one hundred and five kilo category? Yeah. So that's all the way from ninety three point one yeah. all the way up to one hundred and five kilo yeah. dead. Yeah, brilliant. All right, good. So tell us then when you you kind of had the you you, you did that tournament in the in the navy. You kind of found like a, a bit of a passion for it, mm-hmm. and then when was your first sort of big tournament from there? What was that sort of period of time? Um, so yeah, I started doing navy uh, championships, and then. Um, I joined the BDFPA, which is the British Drug Free Powerlifting Association, mm-hmm. um, and then I started doing civilian competitions, and then I started doing uh, divisionals down in Plymouth, and then qualifying for the British Nationals there, and then it was just stepping stones, one from the other, did British Nationals, and then qualified for Europeans uh, in time, and then the World Drug Free Powerlifting Federation, um, and then over a course of time, a few years, I was a part of the BDFPA for about five years, I think, five, six years. Um, I started podium, on the podium, and doing well, and do, breaking, like, British records and single squat records and all that kind of stuff. And then I, I knew it was time to move on to British powerlifting um, because it's like, I, th- I always see, see, see this as a stepping stone. So the BDFPA is a, a, a good federation to join. But when if you want to go down the route of like the IPF, the International Powerlifting, so it's like the highest level of drug tested powerlifting in the world, I joined the British Powerlifting and then started competing against, you know, the even stronger um, men of, of, of powerlifting. Mm. Um, and then over again over a course of time, it's took me, I've been a part of them about six years now, and then just went on to national championships, bench press championships, um, and then in 20, after COVID, 2021, I was selected for the IPF World Bench Press Championships in Lithuania, which is um, quite an experience. <laughs> You're going to have to elaborate on that, mate. So, um, yeah, so I did the nationals, uh, came second, uh, and then I spoke to head coach Sheridan Ray, given my interest, and he, um, I, I received an invitation to represent Team GB um, for... Um, the World Bench Press Championships was the first person in the military to ever uh, be selected for the World Bench Press Championships, which I'm pro- <laughs> pretty proud of. Yeah, uh, it's probably awesome. yeah. Um, I've got that singlet framed and on my garage and my yeah. gym because it means a lot to me. Because you know, there's a lot of people that I see wearing the GBR singlet in full power bench press, and I've always thought, I want to, you know, it's that I want to wear that. I want to. That, that's my main yeah. goal, and then I achieved it over a time, and um, and yeah, I was. I was so pleased when I got um, that that invite. Yeah, and how did the tournament go? Really, really good. I learned a lot. Um, how to prep, going abroad. Um, the standard, the standard of judging is unreal. Like I always train to the standard, but when you go out there and you've got international referees, different country referees, it was. I learned a lot. You know, I even. And and out there, you have to sign a consent form to let the the head coach make all the decisions for you all you do is put your music on warm up and he, he makes those decisions for you and you have to sign that so really? it doesn't matter what you've lifted in the gym and how you think or what your coach back home thinks you're going to lift he's not the one there handling you that day he's not the one how are you how was your sleep you've had if you had an argument with your missus everything okay you know your mental state you know you're out there competing on like a world stage you've never done it before you're in a different country food's different You've only travelled two days before. There's a lot of external factors out there that play a big part. So that form is a big part of like, I'm putting all my trust into you. Um, And it doesn't matter what you've lifted that day, the coach's 
you know, main priority is to get the best lift out of you that day, out of you that day, regardless of what you've done previously. So I had to drop my opener by 10, 12 kilo, just again, like I said, to get on that board. And what I didn't want to do was go all the way to Lithuania and bomb out on, on the first time and represent, you know, put all that effort to get that singlet and represent Team GB on a bombed out. I yeah. didn't, just didn't want that. So I was, I was big enough to say, right, let's drop it. Let's just get a really good lift on the board. And it was easy, but guess what? I was on the board and I, I wasn't going to bomb out. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was something Gerald spoke about actually, wasn't it, with his, his competitors? Yeah, just making um, sure you get it on the board. And yeah, just get a fast like, one done. Yeah, you see the exact same thing. And then the nerves go. Time. I always find I'm on the board. I'm not going to bomb. Now, <laughs> I the, now I can enjoy the. Is that, is that a really big thing? Is it? In, yeah, in powerlifting? yeah. Even like what I've been competing twelve years now, and my first when I'm doing full power when I'm squatting, I get so nervous, and. Uh, I'll squat it and then all of a sudden I'll come off the platform and I'll go, I feel fine. You know, all the nerves, everything, I can enjoy the competition then. Obviously still be fired up and, you know, focused, but my nerves just completely go out the window. It's just a strange one. Yeah, I bet. And when you said that the refereeing was was of such a high standard, what, what's the difference between bad and good refereeing and powerlifting? Um, without getting into the the political side of go it. Go on, get into it. Yeah. <laughs> get it. You know, the IPF's got a rep, represents, uh, a, a rep of... Um, like high standards of, of refereeing, you know. Uh, they've just brought the new rule in of bench press, and now you've probably seen it where they've got this ridiculous arse. Yeah. They're trying to iron out that. They want to see some level of strength there and not just your <laughs> how, how, how much you're flexible your spine is. So uh, that's just been brought in this year. So that's that's played a big part of it. Has that been well received? I think so, yeah. I think, I think a few people have learned that they actually got to train strength now yeah. instead of like range of motion yeah, to, yeah you know it was in the rules you know and they've they've made them rules work for them yeah. over the few years so but I think people just want to see people bench press you know instead of like a two inch movement but um, yeah I think people have, 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 have uh, reacted to the rules quite well uh, but yeah the standard of refereeing and judges because I'm a British uh, British powerlifting level one coach um, and I had to study the rules, and that's just at divisional level, you know. Then you've got national level, and I was looking into it and 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 speaking to people like Paul Marsh, and I was like, how do you get rec- how do you go onto your national referees exam? And you have to be recommended for it. It's not, like, and you have to do a certain amount of time, a certain amount of uh, competitions, referee, and you can't just go. Well, th- four months have passed now. Can I go for my national referees exam? You and then you have to be recommended for it. Oh, really? And then so on until your international referee exam, you have to be uh, recommended for it and stuff. So you have to have like loads of ticks in the box to get to that standard. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a high standard. Um, and that's the root, That's the reason why I've gone down it, because if I think I can perform and lift well on that stage, then, you know, I think I've hit the standard, you know, it, the, the pinnacle point of powerlifting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And are you able to offer any examples of like the nuances in, in the different rule sets? Like, is it, obviously you mentioned about the back thing. Mm-hmm. Are, there, are there any other little things that you need to consider when competing sort of internationally for big uh, big competitions versus like regional ones? Um, not really. Just I just tell a lot of people, like I'm hosting a competition down at HMS Drake on the 2nd and that's just to promote arm, uh, powerlifting in the armed forces. Yeah. Um, I just say to them, just read the rule book, yeah. understand what's expected for you I've seen it so many times and I've been a victim of it as well of squat depth the definition of a squat mm. in powerlifting um, last thing you want to be doing is tra- training and not hitting depth in competition so that's a big thing the bench press and pause in the bench press mm-hmm. um, it's, been, it's caught people out so many times yeah. and like deadlifting instead of like a strong man deadlifting hitching it and riding up your thighs which is allowed in strong man it has to be a clean lift you know you have to pull it in accordance with the rules so the main thing I say is to them is um, understand the rules I didn't know that if it means sitting there and just going for the rules but I think that comes with experience and time though you know doing a competitions and like um, this competition that I'm doing I want to sit together and talk to people and say look how did you perform are you happy with your performance and then have like a in the Navy or the Armed Forces normally after a course we do like a a post course discussion and talk about how you enjoyed the course, how you could improve. And I want to do that at my uh, event that I'm hosting and say, how could you improve your next event? You know, how, you know, your prep, your eating, the food that you brought or the warm up, you know, so they can go on to their next event, improving, you know, you know, and I, I think that's a big part of it. 
because it's took me a long time to fine tune my prep and I'm sure a lot of powerless will, will agree on um, just even just food intake and all that kind of stuff mm. mm-hmm. yeah do you get like different bars as well different bars yeah um, depending on the federation that you, yes you'll be yes in. Yeah. yeah like the IPF have to have specific approved uh, manufactured kit for that competition yeah I mean one of the I don't, I don't know the, the, the detail so again forgive, forgive my ignorance but the, the lad um, who I know who's, who does a bit of coaching um, there's a specific bar that he wanted the gym that he works at to buy mm-hmm. uh, for the deadlift because it, it bends and whips a certain way yeah um, so you, you end up pulling it from a higher starting point but then it like snaps on you a little bit yeah no I, I can totally agree with that um, I did a competition a few years ago and um, I never trained on a, a, a Lyco a powerlifting bar just trained on your normal bars in your gym uh, I just used what was available and then when I competed the the Lyco bar was shorter, so when I used to pull sumo, I had to bring. On the day I competed, I had to bring my my, my stance in, and no it was like, oh. And ever since then, I thought I I learned when competing for British powerlifting, train on the kit that you perform on. Yeah. So, recently, HMS Drake have been very uh, very supportive, and they've purchased an Lyco bar for the gym. One because I and others can train on it, but also I can show to others at the grassroots. I don't know if you're familiar to like Royal Navy grassroots as like an induction to sport. So I can use that with all the Alico plates and all, the, I've got all the kit and I can say, look, this is the kit that we use for our, our events. Uh, and I can't stress enough how important it is to train on this kit because it will catch you out as it's caught me out <laughs> previously. Uh, well, a few years ago at competitions. So yeah, that's a big one. Like, like the guy says, cause I've trained, you know, other bars can whip when you get to a certain mm-hmm. weight um, and it can really throw you off or, you know, <laughs> the affect your training. Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in regard to the prep, mentioned it a couple of times. So, um, you know, the, we're, we're very familiar with that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competition mm-hmm. um, and, and that's that can be a really long day. So, you you know, you might have a, a gi and a no-gi competition in the same day, so you might turn up, you maybe have some breakfast, you weigh in on the day, sometimes like right before you step on the mat and compete. Mm-hmm. Um then you'll compete in your bracket, and then you hang around in this like the holding pen for a bit, and then you might be back out five minutes later, or you might be back out twenty minutes later. Yeah. And then you finish your bracket, and then you've potentially got four hours, five hours, and then you're back in for no gain, you go through that again. And the management of like your nutrition, hydration, warming up, weighing in is a fucking headache. Yeah. <laughs> Talk us through like what that's like in powerlifting. Um Right, so I'll give you an example. I was in Italy um 2015 at the World Drug Free Powerlifting Championships. And um, so I squatted at 11 o'clock in the morning because it was a big event. And then I bench pressed around about four o'clock in the afternoon and deadlifted at like half past nine at night. <laughs> that was a, <laughs> and my wife came and I had my newborn. I think my little one was only like a year old at the time, which is sitting in a sports hall all day with a little one. It's quite demanding. Um, and it was so hard because... You have to get yourself G'd up, ready for your squats. You know, you have your coffee or your Monster or whatever you drink. Get your all your food on hydrate to perform to get your three out of three squats. And then it's just uh, sit about till three o'clock and then start warming up for the bench. So your body's like that. You're so hyped up with the caffeine. You've got to make sure that your food's on point because you want to be fueled as pos- much as possible um, to perform at your best for your bench press. And then it was you do your three lifts. And then relax. And then at the same time, I'm looking to make sure, well, you know, my missus is okay in the in the crowd. Um, and then get hyped up for deadlifts at half past nine. How do you train for that? How do you, how, how do you prep yourself for that? There's no training for it, really. There's, <laughs> there's not, is it? It was a big event, you know. There was a lot of competitors there, but everyone else was going through the same thing. Yeah. You know, so I can't moan because everyone else is, is dealing with the same thing. But it was it was very hard. Mm. You had to get your music on, get fired up again. And it's, it's an emotional roller coaster. Um mm. Yeah, it's quite quite challenging. Yeah, I bet. And what's the situation with weighing in? Do you just do it once in the morning first thing or is it the day before? No, no. Uh, with powerlifting, uh, it's normally two hours before. So if I'm going to normally I weigh in at 10 o'clock, for example, and then uh, I'll compete at 12 o'clock. Yeah. I, think it, I think it's a rule that everyone has to have two hour weigh in, uh, you know, that, that like two hour slot from weighing in to eating, hydrating. If you 
cutting weight for your weighing and all that kind of stuff and then performing yeah. so no one's like disadvantaged because if you weighed in at nine o'clock in the morning and you're gonna weren't gonna weigh in uh lift till three o'clock could you imagine how much body weight you could add on to yourself so you could weigh in at like 83 kilo for example and then by three o'clock comes you could be pushing up to the 90 kit well you know a lot heavier and that's cheap that's kind of seen as cheating isn't it really so yeah. so so with that then so with like the, the the example you just gave where you had pretty much like from 11 a.m till 9 p.m mm-hmm. do you have to weigh in three separate times no 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 for full power i just had to weigh in for them for the world drug free one it was just weighing at nine o'clock i think yeah it was. okay yeah all right <laughs> I guess you could be a little bit strategic with that, couldn't you? Yeah. If, if like, our first lift was maybe, I don't know, like your weakest one, but you were mm-hmm. fucking just insane at the other two, yeah. you probably could just take the hit on one, get on the board, as you say, and then yeah. smash and then go the all two. out on the next ones, yeah. Yeah, interesting. But uh, at the time, though, do you know, you, I imagine you don't know the times of your lifts and stuff, do you? Yes, c- roughly. The, the organisers, then again, I was in a foreign country, so that you know, <laughs> you're trying to listen to, like, the English probably is not the best, but you're just trying to listen out and uh, keep up to date with different weight categories what time they're lifting and then you've got to get your warm-ups on point so you when you're ready to go out on the platform you're you're in the best position possible to do a warm rep max so it's all about timings and stuff is, is um is weight cutting a big issue in powerlifting? Do, um, do a lot of people do it i've done it for a little bit when i was in the 80s 2.5 kilo category and then I, for me personally i know a lot of people do it and they enjoy it but it took the fun out of it for me yeah. you know I've, I've done it before where I've just felt depleted and, and just like drained. So I've trained at 84 kilo or 85 kilo, felt great, hydrated, but then competed and I'm just like, Ugh. and it, for, and then I just thought, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to the weight category above because I just thought, let your body naturally be it's what it is, you know. Yeah. But that's my perspective on it. Yeah, I I, I think because of the, the short period that you've got, it, if, if, yeah, I just feel like you'd... You just limit yourself you're so much. You're holding yourself back, I think. Yeah, because um, you see a lot in fighting, but mm-hmm. you know, not so much with jiu-jitsu because, again, sometimes you're literally on the mat, you, you're on scale on the mat um, in, in the sort of the bigger competitions. But in like MMA, for example, in boxing, sometimes it's like 24, 48 hours before you fight that you weigh in. And yeah. the guys, you see all the fucking time, they literally double in the side. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, that makes sense. Um, with, um, with sort of like... You mentioned about your coach, especially for the GB team. He mm-hmm. would kind of be in charge of managing your, I guess, your lifts um, and making decisions based on what he was seeing. Mm-hmm. Is there any kind of like science used for that? So when I was at uni and, and doing a degree around sports science, they talked about the velocity training where you you get a bit of kit, like a little box with a cable you strapped to an empty yeah, barbell yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they that. measure the speed of your movement. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can use that to measure your fatigue levels and then they'll therefore program based on that. Do they use anything like that? Uh, the head coach and that doesn't for uh, like the bench press team, but I've seen a lot of like the elite full power lifters use that in training. I thought about getting one myself, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good tool, I think, to, 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 um, to use in training. Um, I don't know the, the, the ins and outs of the science and that behind it, um, but it's something I'm going to look look at in, in the future, definitely. Yeah, no, it's an interesting bit of care, and it's, it's, it's so easy to, to kind of carry around and, yes. and stick on any bar as well. Yeah. Um, and then this is one thing I, I'm always curious about, and you've kind of explained it, I think, already a little bit, especially when you said that in competition you almost go for like a PB. Um, but it's, it's something that I wind my mate up about with, but I always say, obviously with fighting, you know, it's a fight, you've got a puncher's chance, you know, you don't really know you're against. Yeah. But powerlifting, you know how strong you are. So I always found it quite an interesting one that you go into a competition knowing what you're capable of yeah. and like how people still ball it. Like, is, is it because you would typically go in and you're looking for that, that new PB? Is that where the, the stress and anxiety comes from, do you think? Yeah, you've got to, you've got to manage expectations, haven't you? You know, you've, you've trained for 12 weeks, for example. You've done all that work to potentially lift that one rep max you know and you've got to be realistic you, you, you see people and you see people looking oh what well, he's just loaded 330 kilo on a bar you're not going to lift that you know all you've got to do is what you are capable on that day you know and 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 be realistic yeah that's what i was about to say what's it like going into it knowing how good someone else is yeah it must be hard to like oh, so-and-so's here today, and you know he's a fucking animal. Yeah. And he's, he's and warming he's, up with 300 he's, kilos. Exactly, go, yeah. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, like, how do you deal with that? You, I try and, for me, like, I bring uh, Jakey Ferran with me. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, he's, a, he's my handler. He's my mentor. He's been by my side for the last, what, 10, 11 years. And he, um, I put all my trust into him. Um, I put my music on, and he just, 
he tells me, right, where's up, we'll start warming up, you've got 20 minutes. And I just put my music on and I put all my trust into him. He keeps his eyes open to when I need to warm up. Um, he looks at the weights. Um, he'll tell me, he'll be honest with me as well, very honest. Um, <laughs> that's moving really well or where's that ain't moving so well, let's drop your opener or something like that. Um, so I'd, it's all about putting trust. If you've got a handler and a coach on that day, I've done it before, I've been on my own. And you've got to juggle it all. It's it's quite hard, and it's it's very easy to go, like I say, and start looking at what other people are doing. Um, you just not, block all that out. You're not within them. There. You're not them. You're not their training. You you know you, you you all you got to do is focus on what you're capable of doing that day, um, and enjoy it. I've I've, I've 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 been a victim of it again before, where I've been so stressed about lifting and that the day's passed, and I thought it's done. You know, and, and I've not really enjoyed the day. You know, if you're not enjoying it, then don't do it. Uh, and, 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 and that's the tr- why I'm trying to pass the message on to, to the others as well, is just enjoy it. You know, no one's forcing you to do this. You've done all that training, enjoy it, have fun, and get maximum out of that competition that you're doing that day. But it is very easy to start looking at the score sheet and what other people are doing. Just put your music on and just do what you've been doing in training for the last 12 weeks or six months or whatever you've been training for. Yeah, it's really good advice, mate. Um, and the, the, the competition in Lithuania that you mentioned for the GB team, is, is that your kind of highest achievement to date? Um, I, I, I th- yeah, putting lifts aside, I think just d- sport being awarded the, the singlet and just being on the platform for the first ever time, you know, for me, it was like, yes, I've achieved what I wanted to do for the last 10 years. Um, But yeah, I I would say that was it. That that was my highest sporting achievement. And what's your next, what's your next goal, what's your next target? Um, I've got, for this year. Well, for, uh, I guess, yeah, forever. (laughs) Just keep getting stronger and and, and enjoy it. my, my next target for 2023 is to try and get the biggest total of any um, Royal Navy, Royal Marines powerlifter, regardless of weight category. Um, I think it's in my grasp. I think if I can put it together on the day, in October, I'm doing the Devon and Cornwall Championships, somewhere local, so I'm not doing any more travelling. Um, and my family and friends can come and watch me. And it'll be my first full power coming back from injury. Um, so I'm going to... I, I don't want to put too much stress on myself, but training's been going well. Um, and I just want to see if I can. I don't think that record's been broken for a while now, um, and I'd like to achieve that, chip that maybe. Okay. So that, that's my next one for the twenty twenty. Yeah. So t- what is that record? I think it's like seven twenty three. Okay. Seven hundred twenty three kilo. But if I can get nine for nine lifts, um, I think I can surpass that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been selected for the um, UK Armed Forces Powerlifting Champs, uh, which is five weeks away. Um, Last year I was unfortunate, unfortunate to do it because I was at the Euros in Hungary, um, and it clashed with it. My timings, my peaking weren't weren't weren't, weren't, weren't good, so I had to drop out for that. But uh, this year my calendar has allowed me to uh, compete, so I'm going there to bench press to commit to the team. And it's it's like we've talked about where it's all you use people for different uh, strengths. Like you'll a good deadlifter, you'll use him to maximise on the points, a good squatter, a good deadlifter, someone who's good for uh, squat bench and deadlift. Um, and if he's good for, like I was talking about the formula, the good lift formula, they'll use them. So you'll use everyone because it's a team competition really. And um, obviously the best people with the with the, the most amount of points will, uh, will win it. The Navy won it last year. It was the first time they've won it ever. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we're, we're planning on putting a good team again um, and, and holding on to that title. Again, in the military, it's hard because uh, you've got people who are good deadlifters and good squatters and good bench pressers, and then they'll deploy, mm. you know, and, and then, you know, it's, it's their job. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's hard to get everyone mustered in one and um, in one go. But last year we were able to do it and capitalize on that moment. And and the guy and the guys won it, which was perfect. Mm. But if we can do it again this year, um, I think if I've seen the team, if we can put it together, um, I think we'll we'll win it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good luck with that, mate. <laughs> Thank you. <flash> it. <laughs> so that, so they're my last two competitions this year: the Armed Forces um, and the Devon and Cornwall champs. Yeah. And, and what are your numbers at the moment? Um, in training, well, in training, um, I won't give too much away yet, but there is mental warfare on yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, roughly, uh, 
my my aim for the competition is to score two seven five, which is five reds, red plates, either end. It's a good milestone for that. Two seven five would be nice. Um, I'd like to bench one nine five, which would be quite, which will surpass my post. Um, <laughs> One nine five. My fucking fuck deadlift PB is two hundred, and I fucking nearly broke my back. <laughs> yeah. If I can, if I can bench one nine five, I'll be pleased. It's just, and then deadlift, deadlift, not so good. Um, so I'd like to pull two seven five, which is five reds again. So my squat and my deadlift are kind of the same number. But if I can bench one nine five, I'll have surpassed my um, my one ninety that I did before I did my arm, which means um, in the space of twelve months I'll have surpassed. Um, my all-time record, which yeah. is quite nice, and then I'm then I'm tipping in the realms of 200 kilo bench press, which I think is quite a nice nice milestone, isn't it? <laughs> Mate, <Yeah>. fuck me, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'll be busting with 140. <laughs> we, we live on this idea in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu that your hips will beat someone's fucking like torso, <laughs> and you can use leverage. Yeah, I don't think it works with yeah, 200 kilo bench press. you, mate? Sadly, we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we won't try and arm by you. But, um, but if I can stay on that trajectory of improvement, and I can get to the 200 kilo point before Christmas which I've set my t- a t- a target even if I just do it in the gym and my bicep holds on <laughs> um, we'll be going into um, looking at podium next year mm-hmm. for um, the IPF World Europeans because you have to be 200 kilo plus mark then um, which is my main goal to okay. get on the podium for Worlds or you know international bench press championships um, I was destined to do it last year, but... <laughs> uh, Toil your bicep, didn't you? Yeah, I fully detached my bicep uh, <sighs> in New Zealand when I was deadlifting. So, um, yeah, it's been a challenge in seven months, but... Yeah, we want to, uh, yeah, we'll come on to that because I want to hear about your, your rehab <laughs> and the fact you're already back to these fucking lifts. Like, oh, no. it's, it's insane, mate. And before we get to that, though, I, 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 I'm really interested to hear about your training programme, mate. Um, so can you just maybe talk us through, like, I don't know, like your periodization, your kind of like your weekly split, um, you know, your percentages, your numbers, like maybe what you're putting in your body in regard to like food and, and sort of nutrition and stuff yeah, as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I've t- uh, my coach at the moment is Eric Matter. Um, he's an IPF powerlifter. Very strong fella, very big fella. <laughs> um, I was at my in-laws a few weeks ago and it was the first time I've trained with Eric and he made me look like a 10-year-old boy. He was, And he's the same weight category. I just thought, how are you, 105 kilo? Um, so he's my coach, has been my coach for over a year now. Um, been great for, during my uh, recovery and previously before. Um, put all my trust into him. He sends me spreadsheet. At the moment, I'm training five times a week. It's split uh, to, like, Monday is squat day with accessories. Uh, Tuesday, uh, big bench session with some accessories. Wednesday I rest because I'm absolutely absolutely fried yeah, for them two days. Thursday uh, squats and bench. Friday big deadlift, and then Saturday bench and squats, and then Sunday rest. So rest two times a week, uh, twice a week. Uh, that's my training at the moment. Um, at the moment we're we're just down to RPE um, six at the moment. We're gradually building back up after uh, European world uh, European championships. We're um, had a break and now we're just rebuilding again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so rate of perceived exertion is what you're currently using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think it's a good for me personally. It works well for me. Um, I can I can look at how I'm feeling and how things are moving. I think it's a good um, thing to use and train of me personally. Yeah. yeah, I think it's definitely under underutilized. Like yeah. not a lot of people really use it. You see it a lot, and yeah, you know, as long as you're honest with yourself, I think. I think yeah, you, definitely. You, if it's an RPE seven or eight. You know, if you, you you're not if you're not not familiar with it, there's, you can Google it and there'll be a scale. It'll tell you how many reps or you think you've got left. You need to be honest with yourself. You can't say that's an RPE seven and then it's like one of those <laughs> grinding reps. You've got to be honest with yourself. Yeah. Otherwise, you just you're not using the that, that scale to to your training properly. Yeah. yeah. And what about your sets and your reps? What do they look like at the moment? Uh, a lot of reps at the moment. We're in that hypertrophy eights, twelves. Yeah. 12s. yeah. But um, it serves a purpose, doesn't it? You know, later on, we'll dial down to the triples or the fours or even the singles, yeah. and all of that work will pay off. Well, in theory, it's meant to. <laughs> yeah, and then and sort of talk us through that what that longer cycle looks like leading up to a competition. So at the moment, as you say, you're sort of hypertrophy phase. How long would that last for, like four to six weeks? Yeah, uh, normally, I think Eric has me about, I think it's about eight weeks. Yeah. I start messaging Eric saying, Eric, I feel fried. I need a deload week and you'll go, right, okay. You look about eight to 12 weeks of solid training. 
your body needs that recu- you know that de- that deload just yeah. reduce all your weights reset yourself and then go again but if you don't do that deload your body's you know only human and the day can only take so much stress yeah. so I always communicate well with Eric I'll ring him up or I'll send him a voice note or whatever and say look <laughs> and even if it's not at the eight, point, eight, eight week point if it's a little bit sooner I'll say Eric I'm feeling fried and he'll go where's right we'll have a break and we'll go again yeah, but and, then, and then what would that next block typically look like after the after the sort of phase that you're on at the moment? Would that go more into strength, and then would that go to a higher RP? Would you start using percentages? Yeah, exactly that. Well, the the RPE will change, the weight rep, you know, scales will change. So we go into the threes, the fours, maybe maybe a couple of doubles, and then we'll just we'll start pushing, you know, those boundaries of of, of strength, and then get ready to peak for a competition. I think I've got about eight weeks before I do the Devon. Uh, championships so yeah I've got a lot of hypertrophy work now then we'll move into like the strength phase yeah. we'll go, and then we'll go go on to the, the, the peaking phase for a uh, competition yeah and do you use sort of one rep max percentages at all or is it literally all RPE for you now yeah I think it's RPE at the is moment. It? I think okay. I, I react better to it I think yeah. uh, some people do different formulas and all that kind of stuff but I find that RPE works best for me I try not well I, I squatted this back then well that was back then, this is now, you know, <laughs> for me that works best. Yeah, and what's that peaking phase look like? So when you know, you've got been for that strength block, you've got the competition coming up, mm-hmm. like talk us through what that looks like in regard to the lifts and, and when, when would you start to taper off and, and how would we'll that look? We'll start loading the bar up into that phase, like we'll start putting some weight on and we'll start doing some doubles and singles and really pr- that progressive over, see, seeing what you can handle um, and then feeding it back to the coach and saying well my technique was really good there you hit depth well there the, the explosive out the hole was good there you know the power off the floor from the deadlift was good and we'll just communicate with Eric and go right we're, we're, we're nearly there now um, which is a big part I think communicating with your coach um, and then we'll just I'll feed that information back and then the following week he'll send me that programme and then we'll look at doing doubles and then singles and then he said, where's right let's really push now on deadlift singles and stuff like that see how you react um, and then normally, I think, depending on how I'm feeling, I normally give myself about a 10 days break from deadlifting. So from my last heavy deadlift session, I give myself about 10 days to recover my central nervous system to recover from it. Then squats about six, about eight days rest from my last heavy squat session. And then bench, I seem to recover quite well from. So about five days, maybe. It all varies. Um, and then... You rest, you fuel up, and then you put it into practice on the platform. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then, can you also tell us about your sort of calorie intake as well? I mean, because because this is something that's what I'm fascinated with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Naturally, to be those that big is. Yeah, but also because you obviously need, you can't overeat because you're going to go up a weight bracket. So how do you? Yeah. What what are your calories, and then how do you kind of manage your weight and your energy? This is quite a big question. A lot of people see. Some powerlifters are like this, but for me, I'm not. Like, you see all these meal preps, and on a Sunday night, you've got all your things. I don't do that. I try and just eat to function. I've learned that, learned that. to perform in training, I need to be fueled. I don't go into too much detail about weighing on food. I just make sure that I'm eating enough carbohydrates, you know, fats. Um, I'm getting enough caffeine to perform, um and protein to recover. I try not to overcomplicate it. It doesn't really need to be that complicated. You can look on the websites of how much grams you need per body weight to recover. It, and that's a simple baseline. You don't need to overcomplicate. I just make sure that I'm fueled for those big bench sessions, those squat sessions. Um, but I know there's other people out there who, who do all the meal prep. And the, but I think you know their goals are different to mine. I sit around about 101 kilo. So I've got that space to play with to capitalise on the 105 category so I can eat and eat. Like the Euros, I was just sat there eating in the crowd, watching my friends compete, just eating. Like how... <laughs> Some people are envious because they're water loading and they're, they're, they're cutting and they're just eating their broccoli and the rice and I'm just sat there with a pizza or whatever. <laughs> a Coke, but I can afford that because I'm happy to be in the 105 category and I can play with that body weight, but I can't see myself going past the 105 kilo category because my body weight, my body height, I just don't think to go into the minus 120s I just wouldn't I still want to be able to run around with my kids yeah. and feel healthy and pa- pass my fitness test I think if I went into the realms of the one t- minus 120s I think I'd start like feeling unfit yeah. and again being in that 
for me being in that position of on the elite scheme, I want to be able to look and feel, you know, feel fit, you know, not out of breath after I've done three reps on a squat, yeah. you know. What's the weight category below again? To 90? 93s. 93s. Could you, do you think you could maintain your strength? I and, did yeah. think about this. Because um, if you, if you, have you done like your body fat percentages and stuff like that to see if you could, no, not really. if you could keep a lot of your muscle? Oh, that's I what probably I was saying, could. Yeah. Um, I find that I need a bit of body fat on me and I need yeah. to feel hydrated. Mass moves mass. It, yeah, just that little bit more. Uh, so for me, it works well for me. So I, I found my category where I feel healthy, fit. And, and, and strong as well and I've still got a few more kilos to play with if I really wanted to go heavier um, but I did think about it the other week I was weighed in at 97 kilo at the English bench champs and I thought I might as well go down to the 93s but um, I got my eating right a little bit better and I just bumped up to uh, the 100, 100, 100 kilo mark mm. Yeah, awesome. You mentioned family a few times now, mate. Um, and obviously, you currently you're in the elite program, so you've, I guess, you've got an abundance of time to train now, which is great. But going back to, to before you achieved that, like how did you how did you juggle that? Because we're we're both personal trainers by trade, mm-hmm. um, and some of the biggest objections you get from people is, is time. Yeah, they they're too busy with work, they're too busy with kids, they're too tired they just can't commit to a consistent training program. Yeah. So so how have you done that, and what would your advice to people be? Um, get a very supportive wife <laughs> um, or partner. Um, yeah, my wife has supported me so much over the years. Um, even like like driving, I couldn't drive till I was twenty five. I think my first early competitions, we'd go to Bournemouth and stuff like that. So she'd get up before we had kids and stuff, but uh, she'd drive me to competitions, uh, sit in the sports hall all day and watch it all. Um, and at home, like. As I started having children, like we we got two two young girls, um, I remember times where we just had our second child and like we had it was a C section, and I'd put Harriet, you know, put the little one to bed, uh, make sure Harriet because she still still had a C section, she couldn't do a lot, and um, she'd. I'd make sure she was sorted on, on the sofa, chilling out with a cup of tea and the little the little one was settled and all that kind of stuff. And I'd go train at nine o'clock at night because I knew that um, I still had to get my training in. And even though I couldn't, like, during the day, be like, I'm going training, by now. It wasn't the right thing to do. So I had to manage my family life r- round uh, my, ch- my, my, my training. And it, if it took go and train at nine o'clock at night because we have three 24-hour gyms on the naval base. I can I can still train at nine o'clock at night and get an hour in uh, of training. But um, yeah, the support, it's it's been challenging. Um, and I asked this very question to Eddie Hall as well. He did a seminar uh, at Plymouth Performance Gym at Manor Street a few years ago. And I asked the same question. I was like, Eddie, um, like how, how, how much of an impact does this to have on you because my baby's only small and I felt like I was in the same situation um, and it does take a, a lot on you it really does like there's arguments I've left the house and I, my mind's not there or you you know powerlifting is a very selfish sport I, I find um, and you have to I've, I've had very a lot of tunnel vision over the years to, to get to where I am and I've been selfish over the years and I, I think I've had to be to a certain degree to, to get to that sport and I think a lot of sportsmen and women have to be um, but it has took its toll on uh, my relationship and arguments and all that kind of stuff but Harriet has supported me over the years um, she has been very good support um, and I appreciate it <laughs> otherwise yeah. without that support you know even now for example I'll go training in my garage and she'll look after the girls and I'll go training for two, two and a half, three hours mm. because she knows I need to get that training in. Yeah. She'll go take them to like a, a nana's or go for a walk or just have them around the house. So the support is fantastic. It has been for years. I'm much appreciated. What did, what did Eddie say about... He said to me, he said, the, he said to me, and I was blown away by it. He was like, um, it took a massive toll on his relationship. Like he used to do security and, and labour work, I think he said. And he'd, tra- he'd be work... And then he'd go training for three, four hours at his strength asylum or wherever he goes. And he said sometimes he'd go for the whole week and not see his kids because he'd be up early going to his job and not see his kids and, like, only see them on a weekend. He was, like, a weekend dad, even though he lived at home and seen his kids. And he went, that was hard. It was really hard. But he, he said he had that vision of it's going to pay off, it's going to pay off, it's going to pay off. But now, being on this elite scheme, I'm home. 
I'm very fortunate to be at home all the time and spend time with my girls and go and see shows at school and take them to school. So it has paid off to a certain degree. So um, I'm very fortunate to be in this position, you know. So, um, but I listened and um, it affected him and uh, it has affected me and I'm sure it affects a lot of sports sports people out there mm, yeah I think I, th- I think to, to be elite in any sport you're right it's 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 a big sacrifice very selfish huge and, dedication and yeah, everyone we spoke to, spoke to who... I, I know a lot of powerlifters uh, um, and they've got families and stuff and <laughs> they've not showed the the selfness, selfishness that I have and it's it's hard because they could have been at the same level that I have um was it the right thing to do? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'll ask my wife. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I, I, I felt that I had to be selfish yeah. to get to that level. Yeah. Um, yeah, fair one, mate. And one thing we spoke to Ricky Bellingham about um, was obviously that he's now, you know, he, he, for, for quite a few years, actually, he's been in the Army Elite programme. Um, and it's become a job now. So, you know, he there's a, pr- a level of pressure on him now to perform <laughs> to maintain that status. Yeah. I assume it's the same for the Navy as well. Oh, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And you, you talked about obviously enjoying competing and and, and everything else. Has that changed like your perspective a little bit now? Has it added some pressure that you didn't have before? Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot more. I feel like I've got to sing for my supper. Like um, the elite scheme, you have to, you, they've brought uh, like a review in now every six months to see how you're performing. Are you on that trajectory of improvement? Is the Navy getting its money worth? of you being out of your core role and being an elite sportsman. sportsman. Uh, and um, I had to do a review with the head of Navy Sport, the national gov- uh, governing body, um, British Powerlifting CEO, Richard Parker. I had a big board and I had to explain to them, right, this is what I'm doing this year. Uh, this is what I plan on doing. All the grassroots, the development stuff, the, um, what else have I done, the, the talks, uh, the promotional stuff, just promoting sport in general, not just powerlifting, because you know. And um, I did the review, and they were they were happy, and um, that's what they want to do. Because otherwise, they'll be like, "Why? Well, what's Wes done? Yeah. What, what's the Navy benefiting from Wes being out?" But of you shit yourself when you've done your you've done your boys yeah, out there. Oh my god, this is game <laughs> over now. And that, a lot of emotions yeah. went through my mind at the time, um, and I thought my lifting was over and done with because that's the ma- the most the biggest injury I've ever had. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, the answer to the question is a lot of pressure on on myself. It wasn't just oh, I'll just get out of bed and I'll go training. Oh, I'm a, it was like I need to perform. And it the, is a job, isn't it? It is still a job. You yeah. know, Ricky said that you as know, well. The it other is still elite a job. guys, the the bobslayers, uh, they have to perform and they have to uh, display that they're on that trajectory of improvement. Otherwise, you're going back into the fleet. Mm. You know. And I will do eventually, you know, you know, I'm not going to be powerlifting and on the elite scheme forever. I'm just trying to enjoy the journey right now yeah. and, and make the most of it and have fun. Yeah. What, 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 what do the military services see the benefit is when, when, you, when they have lads and, and girls competing in elite sport? Is it, is it like a marketing thing to attract recruits or what, what is the benefit? What I think so. For? It's just displaying um, the opportunities yeah. that are out there. Um, it's not really sung from the hills I'd say to get on the elite scheme I had to do a lot of digging and a lot of phone calls a lot of emails a lot of pestering uh, um, and I had to roll a lot of sixes um, and, pers- and and persuading a lot of people because I'd just been promoted at the time so I was destined to go back to sea because uh, there's a reason why I got promoted to fill that position to go back and join the submarine and I was very fortunate to get the right ticks off the right people to get promoted and then go straight onto the elite programme um, but the, yes, the answer to your question again is um, it's it's a it is a, a promotional marketing um, perspective as well, isn't it? Yeah. You know, if people can go, wow, I could be, I, you know, I can do that again. I go back to the Collingwood uh, Up Inspire brief. Those people there, there were, it, it wasn't one of them briefs where you're just like, oh, scrans in an hour, or just look around the room. Everyone was sat up and listening because I was talking to them about the North Pole stuff that I've done, the reaching um, world, sta- world stage and all that kind of stuff. And people were like, wow, this is interesting. And, and it's about, if they can go into the fleet going, I can do this, you know, regardless of you know whatever sport they want to do, then um, yeah, it, it is a marketing thing. I think it is. 
It's a good yeah. incentive, though. Well, it's like it's like I said at the, at the beginning. Like my dad was talking about the Navy yeah. as a result of the sport, so it does yeah, work yeah. for sure. Speaking of Collingwood, have you ever have you ever been involved with a field gun event or anything? Yeah, yeah, I did field gun for the first three years of my naval service. Did you? <laughs> Nine, ten, and eleven, and it was one of the best things I've ever done in this. In the in the yeah, service. I never knew what that was until my, my lad had done it. Yeah. My lad was doing field gun training <laughs> after school, yeah. and I was like, what, "What the fuck is field yeah. gun training?" And then yeah. when I seen what it was, I was like, oh, that's pretty sick. "Yeah." So I got, I, I've got a rehab degree, um, and I spent I spent the, the week, the competition week up at Collingwood oh, supporting. Nice. So we did a work, bit of work with Devonport, and did a bit of work with Heron as well, yeah. and supported those lads and then a couple of the girls through the events or through the bit drills and then through the competition at the weekend and fucking hell mate the <laughs> what they put their bodies through yeah. is, uh, is insane like, what was your experience like it was oh brilliant yeah. the team and camaraderie the the discipline it was great it, it was just a great experience and I again anyone in the in the service and they get the chance to represent their unit or, or for field gun do it because it was so good um so a lot of people won't know what field gun is. What what is field gun? Well, so, it, so. it's not command field gun where they used to do the put the walls up and swing across with all that kind of stuff. But it's Brickwood's field gun now. So um, it's basically a display of um, carrying the, the the gun that they did in the war. I think it was the Boer War, wasn't it? Um, and they do a set amount of drills, fire off shells, dismantle the gun, bring it back, pull it back together, fire more shells, and and then run it home. Uh, and the, and the, again, it's like it's a disciplined, and you have to hit stop the gun at a certain time. You have to you can get penalties for like I think dropping shells and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it's a very disciplined sport, and it's one of the best. Is things. it done in competition format? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so they yeah. they do it all against. They, each they, they all, they all did yeah. simultaneous. Six, six teams. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool, isn't it? You normally do it on a Friday, and then you qualify, and then you go to different plates, like the first <laughs> plate final, the second plate final and the big final at the end. And it, it's so good. And the best thing, you get to meet the other teams because all the tents are, not everyone's like all over the place, all the tents are together mm-hmm. and you can talk to other teams, you get to see other team uh, shipmates and all that kind of stuff. And then afterwards, you all share a few beers and then you, you have a social. Mm-hmm. It's um, It was really good. And on the back end of that, I did the military Edinburgh tattoo in 2011. Um, and... The, the field gun team at the time, Devonport, we got selected for it and we went up there and we performed in front of 10,000 people every night for a week. Mm-hmm. And it, if you've ever seen the Edinburgh tattoo, you can YouTube it, it was surreal. Like we had royal families there doing the salute and everything. And uh, it was it was a great experience. Again, another great experience, mm-hmm. not just powerlifting. It was another great experience within the service. Yeah, that's cool, man. Yeah, the, the field gun events to watch is yeah. fucking awesome. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's fucking but there's some bad, big injuries out there if you don't get your drill right. Oh, is it? People losing fingers. Like I used to be, the, Fuck off. Used to be the extractor, so I used to be the guy pulling the shell out right. uh, with a tool. And if you don't clip it right and pull it out... You, the guy who's shutting the gun can end up taking your fingers off. There's ex field gunners out oh, there. Oh, yeah, because I imagine it's all done really quick, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah, like... and you've got to get your drill, drill correct. And I thought you would have been a wheel man, mate, to be honest. Oh, <laughs> 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 when I did field, uh, field gun years ago, I was like uh, a lot thinner. Oh, 77 agile, kilo days, yeah. is it? So I was quick, I yeah. could move quicker, but um, yeah, what a great experience field gun was. Yeah, I can't stress enough how um, important it is to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and every team's got a couple of big lumps and they're the guys that fucking take the wheels off because yeah. these massive big wooden things right, yeah. and fucking just hold them and then stick them back or on. Or there's so. only the heavy end where they pick the cannon yeah. up and, and, and lift <laughs> it up. Yeah. And then only the tall, big units. Yeah, there's some fucking big lads, <laughs> there, mate. Massive lads, yeah. So yeah, good event. Um, so let's get on to your injuries, mate. So obviously tough sport on your body. Um, obviously putting on a lot of low, lot of stress for your body at all times. Um, we obviously touched on the bicep which we'll come on to and you said it was your worst injury but have you had other injuries over the years as well yeah i think in powerlifting you're putting your body through so much stress you know we try our best to maintain our bodies in the best position but you're gonna get you're gonna pick up injuries you're lifting a lot of weight continuously for a long period of time so you know i've i've had people will agree with me who will listen to this you have shoulder niggles from doing a lot of benching hamstring quad problems acl problems just it's maintenance you try and maintain yourself as well as you can um, and it's only the last few years I've been doing a lot of uh, stretching more I think it's because I've got older as well because when you're 20 you can just jump out of bed the next day and, and, and attack the next session but as I've got older I'm only 34 but I found like oh I need to do a lot more stretching a lot more time warming up uh, just prevent anything else happening but I've tore into costal muscles before quads 
um, shoulder problems. I did my pec minor. It it happens. Mm. It, it does happen. I think injuries. They, I wouldn't say they come part and parcel, but they do happen. And you'd be naive and. and I it, imagine with the frequency you're training, it's it's, it's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah. It's yeah. not, it, especially with the load, isn't it? Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> you know, what I mean, it's <laughs> it's not like you're chucking around baby weights, is no, it? No, so, so with like muscular tears for anybody listening, so there's, there's three grades, right? So you've got grade one, which is pretty, pretty minor. Mm-hmm. You can kill that out pretty quick and sort of minimal loss of strength, a little bit of pain. Um, and you've got grade two, which is obviously a, a, a sort of partial tear, um, yeah. but everything's still attached. Um, yeah, yeah. And you'll get, you know, a fair amount of loss of strength. You get some bruising, some inflammation, some swelling, slightly longer recovery. And then you've got grade three, which is a full rupture yeah. where the muscle literally just comes off. Yeah. Either tears an alpha or the, the tendon just comes off. Mm-hmm. And that's what you suffer in your bicep, right? Yeah. yeah. So tell us about uh, the, the day that that happened and, and talk <laughs> us through like the experience. Um, in December, I was selected to represent um, Team England and the Royal Navy at the um, IPF Commonwealth Powerlifting Championships in Auckland, New Zealand. So, um, yeah, I was out there competing and I did two competitions out there. did the bench press championships and the full power and they were spaced out about four or five, about four or five days between. So on the Sunday, I did the full power uh, and everything was going great. I did um, all three squats were perfect. Personal best on the platform, which was great. Bench was fantastic. Uh, moved better than I expected. And then we went on to the deadlift. Um Originally pulled my first deadlift, nice and fast, beautiful. Got on the got on the board, and then wanted to do some big jumps because I put a lot of training with Eric, and I wanted to go for a big deadlift to get that big total because I wanted to get the the naval the navy record at that competition. But my bicep decided I've <laughs> over planned, so went on to my second deadlift, and I I pulled it so fast when I locked out. I can only imagine. I've looked back on the video. I must have kinked my arm. So when I deadlift, I used to alternate grip, mm. um, and bicep tearing is a lot is a, uh, a very familiar exercise um, injury with doing that. And as I came up, as the referee Mick, uh, the British referee, he just went down to give the signal to put it down. As he said down, it just went bang, and it moved up oh. about three inches. And I was still holding on to it, and I thought, don't let go, don't let go, get the lift, get the lift at least, and it went up. And because it was a full tear, like you said, a lot of people said, where's that? Must have been painful. But because with the adrenaline of the competition, um, I didn't feel feel it. I felt it go, but it yeah. wasn't painful. Yeah. I put it down. Um, and if you have a look on my Instagram, you can see it scroll through. My bicep just goes up three inches. Um, and that was it. That Coils, was it. doesn't it? Coils yeah. And just- yeah, it just it went, it went right up. Um, and that was it. That was it. Um, yeah. That was the end of the competition. But to be fair, I wanted to go for that big third deadlift, but it didn't change my positioning. So it wasn't the end of the world. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Richard Parker was the CEO. He was on the jury table at the time. Yeah. Really appreciate it. He came, came over through the back curtain and went, Wes, don't do any more lifting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which was really good. Enough's enough, mate. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, he didn't want me to do any more. You see people, though, who injure themselves, see it a lot, and they just soldier on. Nah, it'd be fine. They, they, torn the quad on their second <laughs> but they still go on and you've just got to go I want to be able to comp- get back to training you- it's longevity isn't it yeah ex- exactly that and that, that's the maturity and the, the swelling your ego and going no so I really appreciate Richard coming over and going Wes get some ice on it Don't please don't go for another lift which was re- really good from the head of British powerlifting to come over yeah. and say Wes Tomorrow's another day. Yeah, it's, it's so it's so true what you say about the pain though. When I was doing my degree, like if someone's in pain and they've like torn to me, that's a good sign because it's Your still body's attached. Telling you. <laughs> but it's still attached. Yeah. If like if like the day after, yeah, it doesn't really hurt. It's loads of swelling though. You know, yeah. oh, fuck. Yeah. It's because it's off. Yeah, my, like, my mate done his ACL and he was just yeah. running down the wing and it went. Shot and he, went off back. Yeah, yeah, like and he was like, oh, it's, not, it's not too bad. And he yeah. was like, kind of like just around. The and then yeah, yeah. and then he went when I got a scan. He's like, rupture my ACL. Gone. He's like, what the fuck? He was in pain, but like not not you know a year out pain. You know what I mean? Like. Yeah, I don't know if it's, if it's... Did you see the video of it? It's on your Instagram. Yeah, 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 you can have a look. But after I did it, I was so confused because it, I was uh, competing against a... Uh, I think it was a physio or a doctor, I think. Right. He was perfect. He came up to me uh, and he assessed it straight away, which was great. We had medics and that on, on, on site, but he came over and uh, he was like, yeah, it's a full tear. He said it's hard to tell because you couldn't tell if it was a t- tier one, yeah. uh, tier two, or a full, full tear because I... I was still able to do things with it yeah. and I thought if I'd rubbed it it would have been like 
can't use it. So it was really hard for me to work out uh, whether I'd fully detached it or not. But um, got back to the UK and I was very fortunate because when I went to Derriford, the guy who saw me was an ex-Navy commander surgeon. Right. So I was telling him about everything and he yeah. went, where's I can get you in? Because you've got two weeks of um, yeah. getting that treated. Otherwise, uh, you may lose fully function of it and the scar tissue and all that kind of stuff. And he managed to squeeze me in the following Monday. Brilliant. Which, you know, isn't <laughs> very lucky again, yeah. rolling another six because if I'd have, sub- if I'd have gone past that two-week window, I probably wouldn't be where I am now. So I'm very fortunate to have him there. Uh, but he he went, he, he did a hook test uh, which is a test and he went no nah, that's well gone look at it. it's over here somewhere <laughs> yeah. and he said to me he says Wes you can you don't need to do your surgery um, but you'll never get back to full potential of lifting again he says you'll be able to you know do go around your everyday stuff again you'll be able to do stuff go back to work and all that kind of stuff but without the surgery and the rehab you'll never get back to did he give I'm. you a risk factor of um, it rehappening is it is it weaker yeah, he now? Says it, he says it could happen again. Yeah. He says there's you know you're going to go back to deadlifting and benching and, and lifting yeah. big weight. He says there's always that risk factor, mm-hmm. but um, he says dial in on your rehab. Don't shortchange it. Don't stick to it. You know by the book and just be patient and you'll come out better on the other side. And I, I just heed his warning and I, I said right. You see people trying to test the water six weeks in and I'll just do a bit of bent and I just thought no I stuck to a ritual I did everything I dialed in on my supplements and everything Google, googled the hell out of how to make that one percent better like Eric said to me where's order some egg membrane supplements I was like what the hell is this and it was just to help recover like um, help scar- uh, tissue uh, recovery and if it helped me by one percent I'll spend 50, 60 quid on tablets to um, help just get that 1% better. Yeah. Um, so with that sort of injury then competing for the Navy, do you, so you've got the exercise rehabilita- rehabilitation instructors, I yeah, think, yeah. In, the, in the military. Uh, do, do, do they support you or did you go private and get... No, no. Um, again, that's one of the, the great factors of being in the military and the naval service because my healthcare, the doctors got my uh, all my med docs from being at Derriford. Um and then they referred me to the physio. And then um, I started my course of physio training with the rehabilitation instructors at HMS Drake. Yeah. And we, they put me on a course of um, Mike Willsmore, fantastic physio. And um, he, he, he directed me on how to get stronger and more function because I, I was in a sling. I couldn't even move my fingers because of nerve blockers. I had to retrain my arm to get full extension, supination, ex- flexion and everything. Um, and he was, he was fantastic. He said to me, he echoed what the surgeon said, do not shortchange your training. He says he sees so many rugby lads doing it and then boosh. And he says, Wes, I know how passionate you are about your sport. He says, all you want to do is get back up to being full strength. He says, you see these lads coming in here and then they'll tear it again. And now you're 10 months back, you know, you take your 10 months and you might not even fully recover back from it. So he's like, he, he drummed into me, Wes, just stick to what I'm telling you. And you'll come out at the end in a better position. I only saw him the other week and I said to him, look, he was like, where's fantastic? Yeah, well done, mate. Yeah, it's so true. So many fucking people do it. I, I did it years ago. I, I injured my shoulder doing um, MMA. And uh, yeah, I mean, same thing. I just kept fucking around with the rehab at the time. Yeah. The reason I ended up doing a degree about it because I just got it so wrong during that period. It yeah. just essentially ended my competing. So, okay. so yeah, you did well coming back, mate. So how long was that period of time between that sort of surgery and then actually getting back to like full strength. So uh, it was four months worth of solid rehabilitation work, getting full extension of my arm. Yeah. I think it was the fifth month I started putting a barbell in my, well, it was a broom handle at first, just getting used to that movement. Um, and it basically seven months from coming out of Derriford to being back on the international platform, representing t- Team GB, which I think's good. Seven There's months? Some, seven months. To be back to full strength. Yeah, it's incredible. It's um, mental, mate. And if I was honest, um, and Jakey will, will agree with me, but we play, played it safe at the Euros, we could have went heavier. We could have put 192 on there. But he said, Wes, he says, son, let's just get three out of three, good lift, build up that confidence again. Um, and he says, at the armed forces, let's push a little bit harder. So we'll go 192. And then at the Devon ones, we'll go 195. He says, it's all about that trajectory of improvement. Um but yeah, from seven months from going from out of Derriford in a sling to not being able to wiggle my fingers to donning the uh, 
GB Singlet and there I'm, I'm pretty proud and a lot of people have said to me where's that is fast recovery that's yeah. fucking mental and, and I've not like I've not short changed everything I, I had shoulder surgery and they, they had to rebuild my shoulder a little bit just from dislocating it mm-hmm. and I don't know what it feels like when you were saying <laughs> about the the the, um, uh, the stick yeah, so yeah. I used to do that I used to have the stick and I used to have to lift it up and I remember yeah. stood there like oh fucking hell fucking hell mm-hmm. it's so hard isn't it yeah. like just the, the mental the mental barrier of just lifting your arm up or pushing your arm straight for you would have, it's it's it, you can't explain it to people i was um well, when i was in a sling for the first few weeks uh, eric sent me over a good study of uh, um single arm work mm-hmm. so i don't know if you've come across this before unilateral training mm-hmm. so if, what you're meant to do is train your your good arm and it will send over signal, and it will send over messages to your recovery. I don't you, I go, I'll, I'll talk more about this in a minute. I don't call it my bad arm or my, my, you know, I call it like my recovery arm. It's just a way of approaching. Instead of saying it's a bad arm, it's not a bad arm. It's it's a it's a my arm's recovering, and it will send over signaling uh, messages to stay healthy. And a, a few people sent me this uh, study, and uh, it blew my mind. I thought, wow, and I digested it, and I invested in it. And uh, I did a lot of <laughs> sling, unilateral work, shoulder press, and everything. Um, and when I came, when I took the sling off, and I was at the stage where I was given permission to do movements again, it didn't feel like. If you ever broke, I broke my arm years ago, and it was just like, oh, I had to retrain it and everything. But it didn't. I just had to build confidence in moving my arm again and and putting weight into it. So a lot of people are like, oh, do you believe in that way? And I was like, well. I've made up my mind that I am believing in it, I am investing in it. And if it didn't work, there's nothing ventured, nothing gained, really, yeah. is there? But do you know what? That even, even if it was a placebo, mm-hmm. that, that that still has such a positive impact. Yeah, exactly. It really does, because so, it's a mindset thing. Yeah, there's no negatives say. there, is there? No. You know, so it, the guys at Drake Gym will remember it very well. I was doing a lot of single arm stuff, mm-hmm. and uh, when I was able to get back to training again, like I said, um, I just had to start with putting a four kilo dumbbell in my hand and just build, because the strength was there. I just had to build up that confidence. In a matter of weeks, I was back into 30 kilo dumbbells, 50 kilo dumbbells, and it was just, don't rush it, Where's just build up that confidence because I felt like my strength was there because all the rehab that I'd done has strengthened that tendon, you know? So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's wicked, mate. And and just want to reiterate the point. I think it's obvious from, obviously, the, the amount of... Um, drug-free competitions you do in the fact you're in the military but obviously you were you weren't using enhancements through that period no no I, I love powerlifting but I also love my career I love my pension <laughs> I, I love everything I would I, you've got to look at it this way all the work that I've put over the like 11 12 years if I decided to go on a cycle of this that and the other or take performance enhancing drugs I just I'd lose all that reputation that credibility you know every, everyone's like looking up to me going wow people go i knew he was on gear for year, years ago and i just <laughs> yeah. I would, <laughs> you know because there's questions people yeah. are, like, especially the rehab that yeah. i've just done there that's why i mention it a lot it's, of people yeah, go incredible. have you took anything to get that strong i went no i would just lose all that credibility and um, again it, it's powerlifting doesn't pay the bills mm. even though i'm on the elite scheme Kind of does at the moment, but um, I, w- I wouldn't want to risk my reputation, my career, um, and my pension, and everything else that goes with it because I, I'm invested in the Navy. I want to be in it for you know the long haul. Um, so the Navy wouldn't accept you being on steroids? No, 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 no. We obviously, we've got zero tolerance. Yeah, tolerance. I, I don't know. Yeah. No, no, we can't take anything like that. So I just take my protein, my creatine, uh, and then stuff like magnesium, zinc, you know, the things you can buy at Boots, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in, in pushing myself to my, my limit, see what I can go on. Everyone's got their own perspectives on taking uh, yeah. performance. I've got a lot of friends who, who, who do it, but um, I just like to see what I can push my mm-hmm. mental state and my body physically um, to its absolute limit. And it may not be the numbers some of them are shifting, but they're not me and I'm not them. Um, and if it takes me a bit longer to add 20 kilo to my total, so be it. Yeah, that's no, um, It's a good attitude, mate. For, for, but that's, yeah, that's no, it's a good attitude. Yeah. yeah, no fair one, mate. I just wanted to mention it because, um, mm-hmm. yeah, we we spoke about it offline, so I knew. But yeah, yeah I wanted yeah, to make it yeah. clear because the, again, that the rehab was fucking incredible, mate. As as are your lifts. Um, just want to kind of finish up the, the conversation with a, a, a bit of a chat around mental health, really, because I imagine during that period of injury, you probably found yourself in a dark headspace at points, and I think in general we talk a lot about the benefits 
not just us, but I think it's becoming more and more publicised now, the benefits of physical activity on mental health. Yeah. So can you just uh, maybe sort of have a chat with us about, I guess, where your headspace was and how you managed that at your lowest point of being injured? And also from a mental health perspective, like have you found that sort of the purpose that you've had around lifting and training, is that supported? And then kind of what do you see, in, uh, you know, from other lads in the military as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, when my, bicep, when my bicep snapped, I sat down and I had the ice on there and I just thought, my lifting days are done. Mm -hmm. I'm never coming back. There were so many things running through my mind at the time. And I had a wobbler for about a, a couple of hours. Oh my God, this has happened. I'm done now. Um, I, I didn't want to, I've not, I've not got to the point where I wanted, I didn't, I've not achieved. And uh, Jakey, my, my coach, we, he, he was out in New Zealand with me. And we sat down, we had a gin and tonic, right? We sat down, we went, right, Wes, it's done. You can't control what's happened. He says, but what we're going to do is we're going to sit down and work out what we can do. What are we in control of? You know, we got creative over training. Uh, and we, you know, I don't know if you've seen Larry Wheels when, do you know who Larry Wheels is? He did his bicep and he bought this... Um, uh, Rebel Bullies deadlift strap where I was still in a sling and you put it over yourself and I was still able to deadlift it was the best £65 I've ever spent because <laughs> I was still able to do that movement pattern and we got creative and we still worked some areas um, but it made um, it played a massive honest I was it played a lot on my mind thinking um, oh, what am I doing this all for and then even doing all my rehab there's been days so many days I just thought what are you doing this for, Wes? What are you doing this for? You're never going to get back to full strength. And I just had to stay focused. And and this is a big one. I found having the right support network around you. Um, I'd ring Jakey or I'd ring someone who's close by to me or family or, and, and ring them. And if I found myself steering away of down that negative route, that rabbit hole of, why are you doing this? This is pointless. Ring him up and he'd just steer me back on that. Wes, remember why we're doing this. We're going to... Um, we're going to put because I, I we, we we decided as well we want to use this opportunity to pr be a, a, a real life example in the service and to other powerlifters as well because everyone gets injured of saying look with the right support network attitude all the big buzz words you know but there's no lies there it was basically with the right support network and approach and uh, and commitment and discipline you can get back to full strength you know over time you know don't rush it but you can do it. And that's what I did. I'd just ring JK and I'd be like, and he'd be like, right, Wes, remember why we're doing this? We're deadlifting tomorrow. And it would, I would go, yeah, that's right, Bush. And he would put me right back on the track again. I'd be like, yeah, remember why we're doing this, Wes? <laughs> I was absolutely sick of the taste of protein shakes over the first three months, but I took it rigid, religiously because I knew it was going to help me recover. I was absolutely sick of it, but I did it because I knew the end goal was was why I'm doing all of this. I'm sick of taking pills every day. I do it before I did everything, taking all the cod liver oil and uh, vitamin A and all that kind of stuff. Just taking it all because I knew that the end result was was what we were aiming for. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, mate. That's brilliant, mate. And then sort of over the years, have you have you found um, like solace in the gym? I mean, just again, again, just sort of talking widely about sort of mental health and. You know, we've had a few sort of military guys on and it's obviously quite prevalent in the military, especially when guys leave and are veterans. Yeah. Um, but typically speaking, I think a lot of guys really struggle with mental health these days. And we try and be ambassadors for exercise. Have you found that it's it's sort of, you know, kept your head straight over the years? Yeah, 100%. I, I, I'm a big believer of... Um, I've always loved the gym, but I, it, it's like a, a little reset and escapism for me. You know, even before going on this elite scheme and all that kind of stuff, it was just... I could have an hour to myself and regardless whether I had arguments at home or the kids are playing up or work stressful or anything, I had that time to go to the gym, forget everything, put my music on uh, or a podcast and just train. And I'd come out of the gym, you know what, work's not that bad. It's all right. it, it, it's work, but, you know, ring the wife, say, look, I'm sorry, you know, or don't worry, the kids are just kids, you know. It was a good thing for me to just have that escapism of just... It's like a factory reset, isn't it? When things are getting overwhelming for you, just and, and you can do it as going for as simple as going for a walk, walk the dog, or go for a swim. Um, I think it's very important, and I think over COVID period, is it, it the positive from COVID was highlighting that we all need to make time for each other, one hundred percent, and and for yourself, sorry as well. Just even if it's just reading a book, 
As simple as that. We need to make time for each other because life can get on top of us, can't it? You know, work and everything else. You just have that hour to yourself or 40 minutes. And um, I think it does a lot for your mental health, I find. And the people I talk to agree as well. Um, so th- I think that's one of the positives from COVID as well, uh, especially that period, is just finding um, that time for yourself and how important it is that you have that that escapism. <laughs> yeah, 100%, maybe we, we couldn't agree more. Um, brilliant, mate. I really appreciate you coming on. It's been a great chat and um, some really good insights there. Is there anything you want to just finish up with in regard to the thanks or any final messages or anything? Um I'd like to thank uh, J- Johnny Heath. He was the guy who put me in, in touch <laughs> yeah, with you. Yeah, so, Johnny, yeah, yeah, I really appreciate him. Um, great again, guy. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah he's it's a great lesson. guy. He talks to me. I see him in the gym most days. And he went, where's this? Could be a great opportunity. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. Um, and, uh, again, it's just about making opportunities, isn't it? A lot of yeah. people um, just want everything falling at the feet. And it's all about networking, isn't it? Talking to people in the gym. This wouldn't have come about if I not spoke to, to Johnny, do you know what I mean? And it's a good message to get across to people and an insight of like what I've done, perspectives, and uh, join the submarine surface and, and everything else. Um, so, yeah, it's all about making opportunities, isn't it? And not just waiting for, for things to fall at your feet. Yeah, brilliant, mate. Thank you. Cheers, Cheers for coming on. Thanks for coming Thank on, mate. Much. Appreciate Cheers, it. Cheers, mate. Thank, Thank you. you.